every generation of Christians has hoped and prayed that their generation would be the last, that Jesus would come in their lifetime and finally put an end to pain and suffering. And the skeptics are quick to point it out. They say every generation thinks it's the last and then life goes on just as normal. And then the skeptics rub it in our faces. You Christians, you think Jesus is coming, but take a look at the world around you. Nothing's changing. It all goes on like it always has. And that's actually where the skeptics get it wrong. The world is not the same right now as it used to be. With absolute clock-like precision, human history has moved forward from one period predicted in the Bible to the next. Six phases of church history laid out in the opening letters of the book of Revelation have come and gone exactly as predicted. And here we are in the middle of the seventh and final period of history, the church of Laodicea. It's the last of the seven churches, and that can only mean one thing. The second coming is just about here. And there's lots of evidence to support that idea. All the stuff that Jesus predicted in Matthew 24, that stuff's happening right now. The kingdoms that rise and fall in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, well, they have already come and gone. The last day moral atmosphere mentioned in Paul's writings, well, now it's a fact of life. We are quite literally running out of time. So you'd think, with the end finally in sight, that the Christian church would just be excited beyond belief. You'd think that our commitment to finishing the work of the gospel would be at an all-time high. You'd think that our level of spirituality would be unlike that of any other generation. But strangely, reality doesn't match that expectation. The church isn't always faithful to its call. And there's a last day prediction from Jesus that predicted that state of affairs too. Instead of being hot or cold, the church becomes so lukewarm that Jesus actually has to warn us that he finds us unpalatable. He wants to spit the church out. While the early apostolic church was warned not to lose its first love, it seems like we might be the ones who've actually done it. So. How exactly does a generation of Christians, with all this evidence that Jesus is coming, a generation that has the benefit of hindsight to see that all of Bible prophecy is true, how does that generation lose its way? How could we possibly become so tepid, so wishy-washy when we have so much? How can our faith become so sickly when we have more reason to believe than any other generation? Well, today we're going to take a very careful look at it because with time running out, with the prophetic clock near midnight, we need to take an honest inventory and assess our level of preparedness. Are you ready for Jesus to come? And if you're not, what do you need to know right now that will help you get ready? Today on Disclosure, we're going to look at an ancient prophecy that describes our world right now and what that means for you. But just before we get to that, it's time right now for the Bible in the news. With the presidential election now finished here in the United States, one of the minor political scuffles that played out was the question of whether or not voters should be asked to provide government-issued ID before they're allowed to vote. After all, voting is only open to American citizens, and there's always a chance that somebody might try to vote when they don't actually have that right. So, asking for ID would seem like an obvious step to take. And yet, in the last couple of months, it became a political football. On the one side, people say that you have to produce ID for all sorts of things in life. If you want to drive a car, you have to have ID. If you want to board a plane, you have to have ID. And if you want to use a credit card, you might have to have ID. So, if you want to vote, if you want to change the government, if you want to have a say in public life, they say that it seems to make sense that you also need an ID for that. But on the other side of this debate, there are people who argue that checking for ID puts certain groups at a distinct disadvantage. People like visible minorities or young people who might not have government-issued ID or, or people who don't have the money to get one. So some people argue, not very many admittedly, but some argue that asking for ID could be discriminatory, especially if it has the potential to disenfranchise some groups of people. Now, of course, as a preacher, I won't give you my personal opinion on that issue because my job is to preach the gospel, not to help elect presidents or congressmen. 
But you know, the whole debate does raise some interesting questions about ID and citizenship. At the second coming of Christ, the Bible says that God is going to separate people into two groups, those who do belong to his kingdom and those who don't. And according to at least one parable that Jesus told, if you aren't wearing the appropriate clothing, if you're not wearing a wedding garment, if you don't have the right credentials, you're not getting in. In Revelation 14, God makes it perfectly clear that you have to have the right ID to be part of God's family. It actually says that those who stand on Mount Zion have the Father's name written on their foreheads. And that suggests that it's not really my ID that's an issue. What's important is God's ID. I have to have the stamp of God on my life. The Bible says God gives a new name to people who overcome. So, of course, the question is, how in the world can you be sure that you qualify for citizenship? It's the most important question you could ask because nobody, and I mean absolutely nobody, sneaks into the kingdom of heaven. There are no fake IDs with God. So you want to be sure, absolutely sure, that you have the right one. He who has the Son has life, the Bible says, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And really, it's as simple as that. Without Jesus, no eternal life. With Jesus, well, it turns out that's all the ID you're ever going to need. Now, don't you go away because I've got Bill Knott back on the show with us today. He's going to help us unpack the letter to the Church of Laodicea, one of the saddest chapters in Christian history. So hang tight because in just a moment, I promise you, you're going to have a study in the Bible that will be more interesting than any trigonometry class you had in high school. I'll be right back. Welcome to today, today's edition of Disclosure. We're going to be looking at the letter to the Church of Laodicea and my guest on the program today again, and I'm delighted about it, Bill Knott, the editor of the Avenist Review. And I think last week we called you Grand Pooba at the... Uh... That was your label. <laughs> and, you know, I meant this week to go and find out if Grand Pooba was actually a title of somebody in some lodge somewhere other than on the Flintstones. Well, I, I hope not. <laughs> that might be the first reference to the Flintstones ever on Hope Channel. And, uh, Maybe I, the last. Yeah, too. I'm guessing it's going to be the last, too. <laughs> well, listen, uh, I'm really excited. We get to kind of pick up where we left off. I'm really glad that it's you that's studying with me this week again because this kind of gives us some continuity. We've been studying the seven churches in the book of Revelation, finding out, of course, that they were real, actual churches in Asia Minor, but also that they portrayed... Uh, real history of the Christian church from the day of John down to the second coming. So we had the church of Ephesus, which was the early apostolic church, and then Smyrna, the persecuted church, and Pergamos, the church that compromised, and there's the period of Constantine. Had a great study on that. Um, and then Thyatira, the church of the dark ages. And incidentally, if you've missed any of these studies, they're all online at hopetv.org slash disclosure. You can catch up with us. Move from Thyatira into Sardis, which was the Reformation period, which was kind of a bit of a revival and then a bit of a dive again, we found out. And then last week, you helped me through Philadelphia. Now, Philadelphia in a nutshell again, and a 30-second synopsis was... Philadelphia corresponds to the era in the Christian church from approximately 1740 to about 1844, just over a hundred years in which the church experienced a sustained revival of true godliness, going back to the Word of God, practicing the lifestyle of Jesus Christ, focus on mission activity, all of which we looked at in last week's time together. Absolutely. And we saw that, and you taught me something I hadn't really thought of. I'd always heard of the first great awakening and the second great awakening. You suggested there is a school of thought that says there was only one awakening, but that with the War of 1812, yeah. some of that was, see, I was paying attention. Some of the attention, the religious fervor moved west. Um, but then we saw that the real apex of that period comes in the 1830s when a Baptist farmer by the name of William Miller uh, reluctantly takes to the pulpits of the land to proclaim that in his study of Daniel 8, 14, that Jesus would come, well, in his words, sometime about the year 1843 was the term Miller used to use. So about 1843, they kind of hone that and, and, and change it and study it and, re and refine it, and they come down to the date October 22, 1844, and all over the land, people are waiting for Jesus. This is the night 
Jesus is going to come. Take me to the morning of October 23, 1844. There are accounts from persons who lived through there of the extreme disappointment, the profound grief when midnight came and Jesus had not come. Uh, they went back and read the parables of the wedding and the ten virgins and asked, Weren't, wasn't he supposed to come at midnight? Maybe it will be a little longer. But they woke up to the morning of October 23, and disappointment is hardly a big enough word to describe their feelings. That is the historical term given to it, the great disappointment. And, it, and the bigger word there is great, because <laughs> okay. they, many of these individuals had made profound sacrifices in their life economically. Many of them were ridiculed for their faith. Many of them, for believing what they thought was Bible teaching, had been driven out of the churches in which they had grown up and in which many of their families were members. That mo next morning was a time of great shaking across the Millerite and Adventist movement. Uh, tens of thousands of people, almost on the spot, abandoned the, 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 the fervent belief in Jesus' second coming that had animated them for months or years. Now let me unpack that, that term Adventist, just mm -hmm. in case somebody's tuning in yeah. and hasn't been studying with us is just a reference to those who believe in. The term was invented to describe those who believe in the literal second coming of Jesus Christ. It is not a reference to any denomination. Okay, okay. Yeah. The, in, in the aftermath of that great disappointment, in the days and weeks immediately following, people tended to go in about three different directions. A large group simply abandoned their faith in that the second coming of Jesus was actually a historical event. They went back to the churches of their time which taught that Jesus would come spiritually as human society improved. Some refer to this as the golden millennium theory. So, so if I understand history correctly, those people are actually going back to what much of Christianity was teaching before Miller took to the pulpit. Precisely. And Miller was the anomaly of his time for saying, no, there is a literal second coming of Jesus, and according to his reading of prophecy, Jesus should come in or about the year 1843-44. The second group went off into some other kind of Adventist faith. There were several other groups that continued to believe in a literal second coming. One of those, perhaps the best known of them, were the Shakers. These were a, uh, a sect of Protestants who had gathered around a charismatic figure by the name of Mother Anne Lee. She had by this time died, but her, the communities that followed the way of life she taught, mostly in New England and along the east coast of the United States, out into the Midwest, were uh, communities focused on, the, on a literal second coming, but had attracted a variety of unusual practices. The Shakers, for instance, are best known today for the gorgeous furniture they made. Right. But they're also remembered for the fact that as a community, they practiced celibacy. There was no marriage. And in fact, they could only grow by conversion or by adopting orphans from the state who were raised in the Shaker faith. It's not too difficult then to predict that Shakerism did not survive over the decades, and the last of the Shaker communities were pretty well gone by the 1950s, about a century after this. I'm surprised it actually went that long. I had no idea that Shakers existed right to the middle of the 20th century. Again, smaller and smaller numbers. The third group that came out of the Millerite Great Disappointment said, we've got to stay focused on what God has for us here. We obviously got something wrong. They went back and studied the time prophecies of Daniel and said, no, those stand unimpeached. There is, there's no... Well, th this is important to point out because I've heard people make comparisons between William Miller and, say, um, Harold Camping uh -huh. and say, well, it's just the same thing. He did the same thing. But when people, go, I mean, when I go and look at Harold Camping, I'm thinking, no wonder he got it wrong. There's no logic in any of this. But even some of Miller's critics went back and looked at his timetables and said, uh, this is right. In fact, his timetables were the, th the one thing that seemed consistently right. What Miller got wrong was an understanding of the event that was going to happen in 1844. He assumed by his reading of scripture that the cleansing of the sanctuary meant that Jesus was going to literally come and cleanse the earth with fire. Those who followed in the months and years after 1844 began to realize that a reference to the sanctuary in Scripture was a reference, in fact, to the sanctuary, not the earth. That the sanctuary in heaven, there must, must be something happening there that was significant at or about the time of 1844. Okay, so they go back, they re-examine it, they have not, this group has not utterly lost faith. 
They realize there is a mistake for Miller. There has got to be a mistake. The sanctuary is not the earth. They get into studies of uh, passages like Hebrews chapter 8, realizing that there's a sanctuary in heaven after which the earthly sanctuary was, was patterned. They see the flawless logic and they realize we're not entirely wrong. There is something here to cling to. And I think last week we looked at that and realized that a reference to the cleansing of the sanctuary was actually a tie back to Leviticus 16 right. and uh, the Day of Atonement, which was a um, ceremonial day of judgment that came by every once a year. Everything there pointed to the judgment, which the Bible teaches comes just before the second coming of Christ. So the earth actually has moved into the last uh, period of history. But so that's one group. And you've mentioned the others that kind of lost faith, went back to the... But as we look at religion in America as a whole, 1844 becomes something of a, term, uh, a, a turning point for American Christianity. In fact, many scholars who look at the history of religion in the 19th century in America would use either that year or one shortly after it to look at a, a sort of ending of the Second Great Awakening. Some scholars will take it as long as 1860. Most would say about 1850 is the terminus of that period of awakening that we have called the Church of Philadelphia. Everyone agrees that while Christianity and specifically Protestantism continued to grow expansively, that the connection to the biblical word of truth, the connection to the dynamic which had driven the growth of Protestantism in the previous century was beginning to wane. Protestantism was beginning to look a lot like Western culture. And increasingly, it took on the values and the spirit of the culture in which it thrived. And it was actually reflected in the life of those churches, if I remember. I, well, remember, no, I brought, I brought historical references yes. tonight. Look at the homework I have done, people. I knew I was going to be with Bill Mott, and I had to do some homework. But um, there are some writing. Mr. Barnes, the author of a commentary uh, in Philadelphia, noted in 1844, he said, something's changed. He writes, there are no awakenings, no conversions, not much apparent growth in grace and professors of, of the Christian faith, that is. None come to the pastor's study to converse about the salvation of their souls. Others in the religious telescope in that year say, we've never witnessed such a general declension of religion as it, at the present. So it seems to me that we've got two groups. Well, we've got a number of groups, but we've got some groups that say there is something here and we must not lose faith. Jesus is coming. We've got another group that says there's nothing to it. And in that group, we actually see a decline uh, in faith. Well, you can point to individual city revivals that happened in the 1860s and the 70s, and you look at the work of Charles Spurgeon and D.L. Moody, ultimately. What you don't see is the kind of culture-wide awakening or revival that had characterized the previous century, decade after decade, in regions all around the United States, Great Britain, and Europe. And in fact, the, by the time you reach the end of the 19th century, though Protestantism has outstripped all of its rivals among Christian faiths, it has grown vastly in numbers, but it has also grown large and wide and easy and standing for very little of the biblical mandate for truth. So actually, if, if we want to put it on a chart, if we just want a PowerPoint presentation with a bar graph or a line graph, um, things are going well. Things look very good from a numerical point of view. In fact, a, a statement you could put in the mouth of the Protestant church at the end of the 19th century is that it was rich and increased in goods and having need of nothing, which is exactly why it ties to the message of Revelation 3. Yeah, absolutely. And in a moment, we're going to get into the letter to the church of Laodicea, but you are making an important point, and I don't want to miss it. Um, Quality in Christianity is not always about numerical growth or numerical strength or visible uh, indicators of growth. I might say to refine that, it is rarely about those things. Jesus is looking for individual hearts, not mass movements. Jesus is making his appeal, as he does in Revelation 3, to individual hearts. He isn't counting as the world counts. Yeah, you know, it's interesting to me. There was a mega church a while ago that was fairly well um, lauded. And, uh, and the pastor managed to put in 10, 20,000 people into the audience, but a few years later lamented, saying, I've got 20,000 people, but hardly any Christians. Yes. And, there's the, and, and that might be a description of the Christianity that comes out of the 19th century, numerically strong, very large, but how many heartfelt Christians with a genuine relationship with Christ? Well, listen, we, we, we're going to get out into the letter to Laodicea, but we have to take a break. I wish we didn't because I'd love to dive right in. Incidentally, 
the turning point 1844, moving into the hour of judgment rather than the second yes. coming, the name Laodicea actually means a people judged. judged. So this is a real judgment era letter, that last gasp of history before Jesus comes. So in a moment, we're going to go into the letter to Laodicea. We'll look at historical Laodicea. Then we'll take it to this time period that you and I live in. You don't want to miss this because it's actually talking about us. And you'll get a chance to jump into the discussion tonight, too. Go to hopetv.org slash disclosure to find out. I'll be right back. And we are back. I'm with Bill Knott, editor of the Adventist Review, and he's giving me a Bible study on Jesus' letter to the Church of Philadelphia. And just before the break, we ran out of time. We were actually going to dive into the letter. Um, this letter obviously spoke to uh, an actual church in Laodicea, and it speaks to our time period. But tell me a little bit about the letter uh, to Laodicea and some of the things that you've noticed in it that are actually speaking to that first century church that are kind of apt for that community. When we, we talked about Philadelphia last week, the same is true of Laodicea this week, that the latter had special meaning to the people who were citizens of that city in very remarkable ways, some of which tend to get lost on us today. I happen to grow up about 40 miles west of Boston, and anyone who lives in and around Boston knows that Boston is famous for a certain few things. Fenway Park, uh, the old, the North End, the Italian North End, my heritage, uh, <laughs> old Ironsides, the ship, you've got all of these things that are sort of classically Boston. Well, there were things that were classically Laodicea, and those happen to be the ones that are identified in the message to the church of Laodicea. Not surprisingly, Jesus makes sure that his message is targeted on people who will understand, oh, he's talking to me when he says this. Well, take me into the letter. Show me some of this stuff, because th this is so important to recognize that uh, we do need to be students of history if we're Bible students because there's a lot in here. God doesn't just have one layer in anything. There were probably four dominant characteristics of the ancient city of Laodicea that are most clearly addressed in this letter. Okay. One had to do with its geographical location. It was an important trade route, and it was, but it, while it was well set up for trade, it was not well set up for, for resources. It didn't have its own water source. The, the one that ran nearby wasn't fit for drinking. It was full of sulfur and alum. It couldn't be drunk without making you literally sick. <laughs> they had to bring water in on a Roman aqueduct from about six miles away. Water that began very warm out of hot springs and cooled to lukewarm by the time it reached the city. Uh, Thus, the people of Laodicea uh, I were... I, I don't even like herbal tea once it comes off hot. Either cold or hot. One is refreshing, one you can cook with, but what lies in the middle isn't good for much, which is exactly what Jesus is saying is characteristic of his right. church in Laodicea. So th that's actually a reference in there, um, verse 16, because you were lukewarm. Well, actually, verse 15, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's very graphic, but those in um, Laodicea would say, I know what that means. I know what he means. That it, it's like putting a, a city marker right on the forehead and they say, oh, he's talking to me. He understands my circumstances. Another characteristic of Laodicea that would have been well known and identified with what was its, its great wealth. The city of Laodicea was famous as a banking center for that part of the Roman Empire. In fact, we have the record that Cicero, a great philosopher, went there to do banking. It was such an important center. No kidding. And so the, the, the symbol that Jesus uses of their richness, verse 17, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, this was the attitude of the people of Laodicea. We are a wealthy community. We are a prosperous community. So prosperous, in fact, that when the city was leveled in a great earthquake in A.D. 60, they refused the aid of the imperial Roman government to help them rebuild. They said, no, thank you. We can do this ourselves. It's kind of like turning FEMA back. It, it, we're okay. We don't we need got... help. In fact, they were self-sufficient in their own mind, which happens to be not only a city characteristic, but Jesus says happens to be sadly characteristic of his church in Laodicea. They feel self-sufficient. They feel rich increased in goods, having need of nothing. And Jesus says in that, in that they have got a, f a great misperception of their actual circumstances. He makes reference in the balance of this letter to two other specific circumstances that would have been well known to the people of Laodicea. One was the reference to their blindness. 
they were no more afflicted with physical blindness than was typical of the population around them, but they were famous as a city for a school of medicine nearby which produced an eye salve designed to prevent blindness, or even in some cases the belief was it could cure blindness. So Jesus' reference to them being blind in Revelation 3 and verse uh, 17 and 18 had particular relevance to them. The, th the last of the four characteristics was their great manufacturing prowess. They took a special kind of wool that they had bred to become the blackest and the darkest wool, highly valuable, and made products from it. Jesus comes and instead of lauding them for their famous manufacturing prowess, he says, you've got it all wrong. You don't need black wool, you need white raiment. You need, in fact, a symbol of purity which you are not moving toward. Now, what would that say to that audience if they've got these phenomenal, soft, silky, yeah. you know, it's wool, but I understand it was silky wool, yeah, yeah. black, dark clothing, looks gorgeous and rich, and Jesus said, you need to wear something white. In their minds, they're a Roman colony. Who wears white? Roman senators wear white. And, and, and for them, it was clearly setting up a contrast between what they valued and what Jesus valued. And that's, in fact, the, the notion of contrast or contrariness, some would say, is the, the key to understanding Revelation 3. They value this set of things, these characteristics of their city, but Jesus values these things instead. And Jesus is using a kind of shock therapy, some have called it here, to confront them with the, the actual poverty they are actually in spiritually. So, to, to recap, this is a wealthy city. It's a banking city. They have a lot of money, so much so they don't want anybody's help. And Jesus says to them in verse 17, you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. It fits. They have this uh, wool industry where they produce this fabulous uh, black silky wool clothing. And Jesus says to them uh, uh, that they need white garments in verse 18. Yeah. They have this school of medicine uh, temp uh, dedicated to... Asclepios, the uh, Greek, Greek god, god of... of of medicine. The yes. one that has the caddis. We have the snake yes. around the pole again. That showed up in another letter. They have the eye salve and they have the spas. People come here to be healed and Jesus tells them that they need to buy eye salve from him. Yes. Theirs doesn't work. And, and, and um, so really, I, I've read some uh, authors that say this was kind of the Paris of the day. They yes. were sophisticated. Nobody Very cosmopolitan tells. place. Okay. Uh, it, receiving travelers from all over the Roman Empire and accumulating wealth and pride and position. The church in Laodicea had apparently become like the city it served. Even though the message that Jesus called them to was not to adopt the values of their city, they stood not as a witness against all the luxury and the pride around them, but they actually inhabited those same qualities. And that's why they receive a message of what can only be called rebuke in Revelation 3. Well, it clearly fits the ancient city of Laodicea, and likely the believers that may have been in the ancient city of Laodicea, if this is a prophetic period that follows Philadelphia and the Great Awakening period, uh, how does this description answer, for example, to the last half of the 19th century and into the 20th century? If you look at the great growth of Protestantism and of apparently evangelical faiths in this era, you would look at the numbers and say, they're doing very well. Mission activity is proceeding out. Numbers are swelling. Accumulation of institutions is going on. All kinds of things that we love to quantify. But how is the Lord looking at these same things? Scripture gives us an insight by saying Jesus doesn't value all of that institution building that we, are, we tend to want to count. What Jesus values are qualities of the heart, attentiveness to what his spirit is doing. A, a, a heart conversion day by day. That's what he's driving at. And that's what he was certainly seeking in the historical period that launched this era of the Church of Laodicea right up to and including the present day. In every one of these letters, Jesus describes himself or introduces himself in different characteristics. How does Jesus identify himself to the Church of Laodicea? He adopts a, a, as a proper name for himself for the only time in Scripture, he is the Amen. That is, he is the one who causes it to be. He is the one whose veracity and whose credibility is unimpeachable. He is also, he describes himself as the faithful and true witness, a phrase that goes back to Revelation 1, where he's first introduced. 
Well, that's true. Let's take a look at it. We're going to have to take a break in a second. We always run out of time. It's, it's verse 14 of Revelation 3. These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And it's parallel to Revelation 1 verse 5. Uh, the whole letter is from Jesus Christ. The faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Um, this is the Jesus who introduced himself. And you're saying that when he calls himself the Amen, this is the only time that that's used as a name, and it's establishing that truth is found only in him, only in Jesus. In short, when he introduces himself as the sole authority of deciding what is good or bad, right or wrong, acceptable to heaven or not, he's the only one who can effectively see the real condition of the people he's describing in Laodicea. You know what I find interesting is that in Revelation 19, when Jesus returns, there's a very vivid symbolic representation of his return. He's riding a white horse. Yes and there's a sword coming out of his mouth. Yes. And with that, he strikes the nations. The sword in Scripture is the Word of God. In Hebrews chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 6, sharp two-edged sword. It's like Jesus is saying, what really matters is truth. What really matters is what I said. And that's always been the issue, hasn't it? From the Garden of Eden, uh, Satan comes in and says, did he really say you're going to die? Is that, it's the Word of God that's been questioned. Jesus says to these people who are self-sufficient, uh, I'm the truth. What matters to me is what's real and what's true, not what you think is important, but what's real and true. Instead of getting your values from your society, get them from my word. That's the call of Jesus, not only to the historical church of Laodicea, but to the historical epoch, to the era of, of church history, which we're living in now. Get your values from my word, not from the culture around you. All right. He also describes himself as the beginning of the creation of God, and we need some time to unpack that. It's huge, and it does pertain to this time period in a very special way. So we're going to come back in just a moment. You can call in at 888-730-HOPE. That's 888-730-4673. Send us a text message, 707-200-1099. And if we don't get too carried away, I'll get to your question. HopeTV.org slash disclosure. We're looking at the letter to the Church of Laodicea. I'll be right back. We are studying Jesus' letter to the Church of Laodicea. We have discovered that it is the final of seven periods of history that uh, the Christian church goes through from the days of John over to the second coming of Christ. It is the final phase. We live in it now, begins roughly in the middle of the 19th century. And uh, before the break, uh, Bill, we were discussing how Jesus introduces himself to this church, which has a lot of problems. They, they're self-sufficient, they're a little bit arrogant, um, and, and so on. He describes himself as the truth. I'm the amen. I'm the faithful and true witness. But then he introduces himself in verse 14 as the beginning of the creation of God. Now, that is loaded. We could probably do a whole show just on that. Um, because some people will take that saying, aha, Jesus is the beginning of the creation. He's a created being. Unpack that statement for me. Probably the best way to understand it is by looking at another passage of Scripture. Okay. If we go back to the book of Colossians, mm -hmm. actually Colossians chapter 1 and verses 15 to 20, we discover that, in fact, we have another reference to Jesus and his involvement with creation. If we look at verses 15 and 16, it says of Jesus, He is the image of the, first, of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through Him and for Him. In other words, the reference to Jesus being the firstborn of creation has to do with the fact that He is the agent of creation, not the first created being. Colossians, the city that's literally only 10 miles down the road from Laodicea, would have clearly read this same message. And we know of other letters of Paul's that right. passed between them. So Paul is drawing on a knowledge that was already in that region that Jesus is not a created being. He is the one who has created all things. Fascinating. You know, this is, uh, this is a thought that comes new to many people. When I, I grew up in a Christian home, Christian school, we knew God created the world, but nobody ever zeroed in on the fact for me that Jesus was the member of the Godhead that was the agent of creation. And it wasn't until I was an adult that somebody pointed out this passage in Colossians, and there's kind of a triad of chapter 1s oh, yeah. that, that emphasizes. Colossians 1 says it. John, John chapter, chapter 1, yes. John chapter 1 says it. 
Um, and I, I really want to underline this because every so often in Christianity, you get a, a little movement popping up here or there that says, oh, Jesus is a created being. He's not fully God. He's part of the creation, not taught by Scripture. Where is it? It's John 1 and uh, uh, 10. John, verse 10, right. Well, actually in verse 3, too. John 1 and verse 2. John 1, verse 2, He was in the beginning with God, speaking of Jesus. Then verse 3, All things were made through, through him. him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Uh, John 1 and verse 10, He was in the world, and the world was made through Him. The world did not know Him. It's quite clear. Yes, the God had created, but it was Jesus who was the special agent of creation. Colossians is simply affirming the truth that John has written in John chapter 1. By the way, the same author, we believe, who writes the book of Revelation, who is clearly consistent with his own teaching, not that Jesus is a created being, but that Jesus is the one through whom all things are created. This is the, the uniform witness of the New Testament apostles. Let, let, let me get my triad of chapter 1s in yes. here, because it also is repeated again in Hebrews chapter, chapter 1. Two, I want to underscore this because so much rides on our concept of who Jesus is. Who is he? Who is this that gave his life for me? Is he a created being or is he God? Hebrews 1, uh, verse, verse 3, 2 and 3. 2 and 3. Uh, speaking of Jesus, has in, God has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Jesus is creator. Now, let's take that thought for a moment and apply it to the time mm -hmm. period described by Laodicea. Mm -hmm. Something is happening in the mid-19th century with regards to who the creator is. One of the most remarkable philosophical and you could call it theological developments of the 19th century is the, the introduction of the ideas of, of evolution, popularized by Charles Darwin, himself an Anglican Christian, a man who didn't believe that his scientific viewpoints were incompatible with his belief in Jesus Christ. Yet by the time he finishes his lengthy career, much celebrated scientist, the, the theory bearing his name has already begun sweeping through the Christian world, he is no longer affirming that all things are created through Jesus Christ. He's saying, no, in fact, there was no creation. Jesus was apparently only a bystander as as organic forces evolved all life on this planet. Fascinating. What I find fascinating is the timing. In the 1830s, as William Miller is preaching the second coming of Christ, um, Charles Darwin is on the Beagle. Yes. And he's starting to formulate. It wasn't really his theory. I think he got some of it from his dad and, and so on. It wasn't brand new with him. But he's, Another man named Lamarck uh, preceded him in the, in the earlier generation right. who has a somewhat different view of how evolution occurs. But he's synthesizing it, and then he popularizes it. In 1844, yes. the year of the disappointment, he's working on his notes from 1842, and he drafts an essay on evolution. That eventually becomes a book in 1859, The Origin of the Species. The timing is remarkable. It can't be coincidental. By January 13, uh, 1938, the Church of England, which is the church Darwin was a member of, adopts the theory of evolution as their official stance. And today, the Roman Catholic Church has itself also said that a theory of evolution is not incompatible with Christian faith. Many in the Christian world have moved to the position that one can have Jesus as a divine figure, but take away from him his creative agency in, in creating everything we see and know. Now, here's what I find absolutely remarkable, Bill. I mean, I wish we had 18 hours for this. Here we have a church that's kind of losing its grip, and it's self-sufficient, and it's starting to believe in another theory of origins, and yet there's a faithful people that, you, as you mentioned earlier, stay true with Jesus, and they have a message for the last days. It's in Revelation 14, verse 7. They say to the world, fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has there's come. that word for which Laodicea is named, an it's, hour of judgment. It's the judgment hour, and what do they say next? Worship Him mm. who made. Worship the Creator. So we have two sides. We've got a, a world losing its faith, letting go of the Creator, but we've got another group saying it's the judgment hour. 
come back to the Creator. I mean, what a fitting description of that time period in the 19th century. Revelation 14, many Bible scholars believe, picks up language that is used from Genesis all the way through to the book of Revelation in, in evoking the knowledge of God and specifically of Jesus as Creator. It invites us always to worship Him who made us and made all things. You cannot take Jesus' creative role out of His role and still have the same Lord. All right. Creation and the Second Coming, in a moment we're going to come back to those two words. It's going to be big. I'm going to be back in just a moment. Seven letters addressed to seven churches, and we find out they represent historical periods from the day of John the Revelator to the Second Coming of Christ. And right now we're looking at the letter to Laodicea. Now, all the letters are addressed to everybody. We can all draw something out of each of those letters for our own life and our own relationship with Christ, but the letter to Laodicea is our time period. It's very specifically speaking to you and I as much as the letter to Philadelphia was speaking to the generation that lived just over 150 years ago. And uh, Bill, we were talking just a moment ago that as the church moves out of this revival period into really the decline of Protestant yes. America, yeah. Yeah evolution and an attack on who the Creator is rises to the surface completely foreshadowed in this letter. Jesus says, hey, I'm the beginning of creation. That's how he introduces himself. We've got two concepts now that we've really touched on, big ones, creation and the second coming. And uh, during one of the breaks, you mentioned to me that these are still with us today. These are big thoughts. Only one of the groups that emerged from that great awakening of 1844 took both of those ideas and ran with them. A relatively small group of people, who would then be numbered in the hundreds, were committed to the biblical teaching about Jesus as creator, that all things were created through him, and were also committed to the biblically taught belief that he will come again, that there will be a literal second coming. Those ideas were highly unpopular, unpopular on the creationist side because of the growth of Darwinism, and unpopular on the Adventist, the second coming side, because almost everyone else in the Christian world had spiritualized away his coming. He would come spiritually. There would be an age of human progress, convergent with the theory of evolution, that all things were moving forward. But let's take a look 150 years later at the success of those ideas. Okay. If you look at the notion of those who believe in a literal second coming of Jesus, those persons could be numbered in the hundreds, maybe a few thousands in the middle of the 19th century. Today, tens of millions of Christians around the world in all kinds of faith communions have come to that understanding because the Word of God has shown it to them again and again. That idea has grown even while people have remained in a variety of other faiths. The other idea, creationism, went through a massive assaults in the Christian, Protestant, Catholic churches of the last century. And yet today, more people identify themselves as creationists than did 100 years ago. Which is remarkable to me because it really is constantly under assault. Those two ideas are the pillars of a biblical faith that continually goes back and says, not only did God make all things, but he has a system for human life. He has a day on which he wants us to worship him. His word continues to speak to us in this time period. These ideas are central to a faith community that wants to be faithful to the word of God, listen to all that he has to say, and take very seriously the message to the church at Laodicea. Now, I still, I find it so remarkable that the last generation carries this message from Revelation 14. Yes. To me, that's the focal point of the book of Revelation. It comes to a climax when they're proclaiming that message. Again, it's Revelation 14, uh, verse 6. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. It's describing a movement that goes around the world, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. There is the last day message that God's people deliver to the world. And there are the thoughts that come out of this time period. When William Miller is preaching, he says it's the second coming. They realize his mistake and realize that's the hour of judgment. And we are now living in it. And Jesus says, 
I'm the creator. Don't forget I'm the creator. And that's a core issue in this thing. It gives me goosebumps. It means that we're the generation that are supposed to be delivering this, this message in Revelation 14, verse 7. If people paid attention to the biblically taught doctrine of creation, of Jesus as creator, if they paid attention to the day in which he says to worship him, if they followed through consistently, they would end up accepting the whole revelation of God and would be that faithful group that we saw in Philadelphia revived again here at the end of time. This stuff gives me goosebumps. I want to be part of that movement. Now, Amen. you have been to Laodicea, haven't you? And, uh, and you were sharing with me a little earlier this evening something that touched your heart. I had the opportunity some years ago to go on a tour of the sites of the seven churches in present-day Turkey and was walking across the landscape recently excavated in Laodicea most of it is broken bits of columns and fragments. I turned a corner and suddenly set against the blue Turkish sky, there was this doorway in Laodicea. It, I was instantly struck by the language of the letter to the church at Laodicea. Jesus saying, behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's what he was doing again that day in my heart. I heard him knocking. It's it, 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 that is the actual door that That's you saw. That's the actual doorway I saw. It, it gives me goosebumps that that door is still there. Yes. Sometimes I wonder if God doesn't let things just linger like the pillar that was found in one city that, yes. that's mentioned in the reward. And here's Jesus knocking on the door. Let me ask you this question. In the moments that we have left together, this imagery of Jesus knocking on the door and saying, I want to come in and eat with you. Why is that so uh, powerful? Why does that touch our hearts? Everybody loves that passage. It, it, it pulls at us precisely as God intended that it would. Jesus is offering not just, I am a Lord of the masses, but I am your individual Savior and Lord, John. That's what Jesus is saying. He's personalizing the faith of Jesus into highly you know, individual terms. He's not relating to us as just another member of the human race, just a member of a faith community. Jesus is saying, I'm here to be your friend and your companion for life. Oh, companion's a big word, big a Latin word. word. Yeah. Two words, con together, panus, bread. It's a companion, literally in the Latin language, is one who shares bread. It's very intimate. That's who Jesus is. When you said companion, it fits. I want to come in and eat with you. And I love the way that Jesus knocks at the door. He doesn't kick it in. He doesn't blow it down, even though people have talked about God in those terms, yes. do it my way or else. Yeah. Now, no, he owns everything. He is the creator. He's the beginning of all things. And he knocks at the door and says, please. He offers the person inside the door the choice to respond. My, that day in Laodicea, I made my choice all over again. And every day that I hear him knocking at the door of my heart, I can turn to him and I say, Lord, I'm opening the door for this day and for always. Uh, amen. I, it's moving to me. And it also says that as miserable and blind and naked and wretched as we are, Jesus is saying, it's not over. Yeah. I'm still there. I care about you. I don't throw you away because you're making mistakes. I want to come in. And if you overcome, I will grant you to sit on my throne. And the overcoming will only happen if we let him in. It's nothing we do by ourselves on the other side of a locked door. The overcoming means by accepting his grace, by accepting his teaching, by conforming our lives to his word. Then we have the right to share eternity with him, to sit with him on his throne. We have burned up our study time. I'm going to come back in just a moment with a few more thoughts on Laodicea. Bill, oh man, I wish we had more time. Thanks, Thanks. so much for coming on. Thank you. So here we are just moments before prophetic midnight, and the Bible asks us a critical question. Are your eyes open enough that you can actually see your spiritual condition the way that God sees it? Right now, there are thousands of religious voices competing for your attention, and a lot of those voices are saying, hey, everything's okay. You're fine just the way you are. There's nothing to worry about when it comes to your relationship with God. And you know, in some ways, I, I guess they're right. God really does love you just the way you are. You don't have to fix yourself to come to Jesus. But that doesn't mean that everything is fine from there on out. The letter to the Laodiceans make that, uh, makes that pretty obvious. That letter is a last day warning for Christians that not all is well. We might think that we're spiritually rich, but it's not true. And God actually loves us enough to tell us the truth about our condition. He tells it like it is. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, he says, that you may be rich, really rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. 
According to God, the last day church needs to open its eyes and take an honest inventory. We need to be sure that our spirituality is real, that our faith is based in truth. If we think we've managed to clean ourselves up enough for God's approval, we're going to be in for a shock when we actually meet Him. If we're counting on our own works and our own goodness to get us through, we're going to meet with catastrophic disappointment. We're going to find that we really don't have what it takes. If we think that we can fix our own addiction to sin, that we can clean the slate and face the judgment all by ourselves, we will meet with disaster. You and I just don't have what it takes. Spiritually speaking, we really are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, exactly the way the Bible says. We are powerless to bridge the gap between us and the one true Creator God. Now, I know that some people would call that negative thinking. And our generation has been raised to think that we really don't have to face the consequences for bad decisions. But in the pages of the Bible, we meet the undeniable truth. We are sinners in desperate need of a Savior. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, Jesus says. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Now imagine that. You, a sinner, invited to sit down with the Son of God for dinner. And with the clock running out and Jesus coming soon, that's the best offer you will ever find. And with all the effort God puts into winning you into the kingdom, what reason could you possibly have to say no to Jesus? When He knocks, you need to be opening the door. When He asks to dine with you, it's time to sit down at the table with Jesus. I'm Sean Boonstra, and you've been watching Disclosure.